Hey, it's Lou, and here's the thing. The consequences of climate change are only going to get worse. An October 2018 report from the IPCC concludes that climate outcomes we once considered far away are now expected by 2040. Things like worsening droughts, wildfires, and food shortages. If we stay on our current trajectory, up to 69 million people will be impacted by flooding in coastal areas, which could ignite a global refugee crisis. Meanwhile, the fourth national climate assessment released in late November by the US government asserts that climate change might shrink the American economy up to 10% by the end of the century. That's twice as harmful as the Great Recession. The assessment also links climate change to crop failures and crumbling infrastructure. It's a bleak picture for sure, but not a hopeless one. In fact, embedded in the IPCC report is a potential solution, one supported by policymakers across the political spectrum. I'm talking about carbon pricing. It's a simple concept. Charge companies and consumers for the greenhouse gases they emit, thereby discouraging CO2 emissions and spurring investments in clean energy. The question is, are we willing to pay with our pocketbooks now so that future generations don't pay with their property, security, and lives. Putting carbon dioxide in the environment has a negative economic impact. That IPCC report estimates it could cost the global economy $54 trillion by 2040. Problem is, the companies and individuals putting that CO2 in the environment are not paying the associated bill. Instead, we're all stuck with it. Doesn't matter if you're an oil baron with an energy intensive crypto mine or an environmentalist that rides your bike to the composting facility. Climate change doesn't make character judgments before it unleashes floods and wildfires. Meanwhile, most companies are so narrowly focused on their balance sheets, on making money and returning value to shareholders, that they tend to ignore the societal damage associated with their business decisions. This ignored cost is often called an externality or a social cost. And look, I get why businesses have environmental blinders on, especially publicly traded companies that are pushed by Wall Street to show quarterly growth. Inputting the effects of climate change into the decision-making process is difficult. It's sort of a nebulous, far-off thing. It doesn't fit neatly into a balance sheet. And that's the beauty of a carbon price. It speaks the language of business people. I'm talking about math. Forget Al Gore documentaries and Leonardo DiCaprio speeches. This is what corporate decision makers respond to. It's a really straightforward concept. Hey, you put CO2 in the environment. That comes at a cost. You ought to pay for it. You'll be charged X amount of dollars per ton of carbon dioxide you put in the environment. You can slide that X figure, whatever it is, right into your spreadsheet and watch it change the all important bottom line. There's now a direct, immediate connection between your carbon dioxide emissions and your expenses, your profitability. And when it's easy to see that relationship, it's easier to see the tangible bottom line benefits to changing your behavior, to emitting less CO2. Barry Rabe, a professor of environmental policy at the University of Michigan and author of Can We Price Carbon, told me a carbon price is sort of like a sin tax levied on gambling, cigarettes, and alcohol. He pointed out that the taxes imposed on tobacco in particular reduced the amount of smokers in the United States. This was a major public health win that saved many people from lung cancer. Perhaps a carbon price will have a similar effect on the health of the planet. Because carbon pricing is what economists call an economic signal. That is, when emitting CO2 becomes expensive, companies and consumers will search for alternatives. They'll invest in technologies that are not CO2 emitting. For instance, if you notice that your electricity bill is high because of carbon pricing, perhaps you'd be motivated to finally buy solar panels. In this way, carbon pricing is sort of a forcing mechanism that encourages environmentally friendly behavior. If you don't adopt clean technology, you'll be paying a higher price. This plays out on the industrial level as well, and with much greater impact. Companies will have a financial imperative to focus their research and development operations on generating cleaner energy, on pursuing technologies that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is likely more expensive in the short term, but as these technologies improve, as there's more focus on them, they'll get cheaper and can result in long-term savings. Electric cars are more affordable than they used to be, for instance, because battery prices are coming down as more and more R&D money is being spent on their development. Look, 
No secret here, I'm clearly in favor of carbon pricing, getting on a carbon light path that still allows businesses some flexibility will help us avoid those horrific outcomes described in the IPCC report without immediately upending the economy. Lowering emissions will also bring health benefits. However, carbon pricing isn't a cure-all, it's just part of the solution. And the devil is really in the details. The actual price of carbon, that X value I mentioned earlier, is impossibly complicated to compute. It involves forecasting what the global economy looks like hundreds of years from now. That's why different economists have produced very different figures. But Dr. Noah Kaufman, a research scholar at Columbia University Center on Global Energy Policy, who gamely described a lot of the challenges of calculating the price of carbon to me, told me just because we lack precision doesn't mean we should walk away from a potential solution. If your doctor says you're at risk of heart disease, you take precautions even if his warning doesn't come with an exact percentage. Still, there are some legitimate concerns with the viability of carbon pricing, and that has a lot to do with a dirty word, the T word. I'm talking about tax. Keep in mind, there are two main carbon pricing approaches. The first is cap and trade. Basically, the government caps or limits the amount of carbon dioxide emissions that are acceptable, say 10,000 tons of CO2 a year. The government then generates and distributes carbon credits that equal 10,000 tons. If you're a company that wants to emit carbon, you need a corresponding number of credits. Companies can sell their credits to each other. That's the trade part of cap and trade. The second carbon pricing approach, and here comes the T word again, is called a carbon tax. The government sets a price, a tax, on each ton of CO2 emissions. If you emit CO2, you gotta pay that tax. In either scenario, companies are paying more to emit carbon dioxide and are definitely going to pass that extra expense to the consumer. Electricity bills will go up in the short term. Wealthier people might be able to stomach this, but it's a different story for poorer folks who devote a higher percentage of their income to energy expenses. This is why carbon pricing is often called a regressive policy. But taxes work two ways. The taxes collected by the government, the tax revenue, could be earmarked to subsidize the energy expenses of the neediest. It could also be returned to citizens as a sort of dividend that would help offset increased gasoline prices, for example. Maybe it could fund vouchers for solar panels. In practice, however, the tax issue is very tricky. Few politicians, and few voters for that matter, are willing to accept a tax high enough to really put a dent on carbon dioxide emissions. Most of the existing carbon pricing schemes in municipalities around the world, including in several US states, are so low that they're nearly ineffectual. There's not enough of a price signal, not enough of a disincentive to turn away from carbon intensive practices. Stanford scholar Jeffrey Ball calls carbon pricing a narcotic that gives politicians and the public the warm feeling that they're fighting climate change even as the problem continues to grow. Ball calls for an effective solution, not a theoretical one. But here's the thing, and this is something I truly thought I'd never say. Bring the high tax on. Make it high enough to be an effective solution, not just something that works in an academic paper. Make the thing painful if need be. I'd rather pay cash now than lose my house, my life, or a loved one in a flood or a fire or through a drought. Short-term sacrifice is a small price to pay for long-term sustainability. Kaufman told me proponents of carbon pricing who claim it will pay for itself, that it's a win-win, that it won't impact the economy at all, they ought to embrace that carbon pricing is a bit of a sacrifice, at least in the short term. Ray points out that carbon pricing will only work if politicians are straightforward and direct with their constituents. This isn't gonna be a viable solution if politicians play games. In Australia, for instance, where a carbon tax was implemented and then eliminated, Ray told me the plan was never very clear. It was sloppily rolled out. It was easy for voters to resent a program they didn't understand that was mismanaged. It was easy to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But Rabe added that in places where a carbon tax has worked, like in British Columbia and several Nordic countries, the messaging was clear. The goals were measurable. A collective sense of purpose was built. Yes, you're going to pay a little more for your utility bill, but you're saving the planet. This gets at a final important point. 
a carbon pricing scheme will only be truly effective if the global community gets on board. China and India are particularly important in this regard. China has promised to introduce a carbon pricing system, but they've since watered it down. Of course, U.S. President Donald Trump has pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement. His administration has espoused views on man-made contributions to climate change that are out of step with the scientific consensus, although several prominent Republicans have called for some form of carbon pricing. Look, convincing everyone to prioritize the environment over short-term economic concerns is going to be a challenge. It's politically difficult for anyone to support a tax of any sort. However, it's time we all look past our narrow self-interest and we start taking responsibility for the planet we're handing over to our children. Someone has to step up, someone has to lead, because non-action is essentially a global suicide pact. Okay, I'm gonna go live my life.